So thank you for inviting me to join the session today. Um, I represent the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, and I'm going to tell you in the course of the presentation more about our work. But before we get to that, it's important to reflect on where we stand as a global family in terms of our experiences in relation to the last pandemic uh, that we had to face together and the challenges that, that rising to meet that pandemic uh, presented to us as international organizations, as citizens of countries, as regions, and as the globe. So if I may begin with um, our assessment at CEPI of what the world needs in order to be better prepared. Fundamental to preparation for the next pandemic is a diversified vaccine manufacturing system that will sustainably supply vaccines across the world through inter-epidemic or pandemic periods. And while having the ability to rapidly rise to meet an epidemic or pandemic challenge. So that's the first point. This rapid mobilization, this agility to meet the next challenge we refer to as surge demand. And critically important, especially for the less developed sections of our world, for the global south, uh, the, abil the, the ability to finance a rapid ramp up of manufacturing and uh, capabilities to meet demand is sometimes a challenge and something that we have to continually pay attention to. In order to deliver manufacturing capacity across the world and to bring vaccines closer to our populations, we need robust supply chains. In my previous role, I often met with governor, governments across the African continent all of whom were very keen to have manufacturing capability within their country. And this is an understandable am ambition given the uh, economic spin-offs that come with uh, manufacturing capabilities uh, and uh, economic development consequences that emerge from that. But where we struggled to realize business cases in many, if not most countries, was in the development of supply chains to sustain those manufacturing enterprises. Now, why do I keep focusing on manufacturing? Fundamental to our approach to dealing with the next epidemic or pandemic is bringing manufacturing closer to the source of the next potential outbreak. And concomitant with that desire to spread manufacturing capability across the world so that when the next outbreak emerges, when the next risk to public health emerges, we have manufacturing and supply capabilities close at hand uh, is equally the principle of diversification across the world. So that if some part of the world is rendered incapable of delivering manufacture, uh, man, ma delivering medical countermeasures to respond to a crisis, other parts of the world can rise to that challenge. So the principle of geodiversification is fundamental to our, in our view, to response to the next outbreak, epidemic or pandemic. These manufacturing capabilities, of course, need to be supported by R&D to develop those measures that will render the next uh, viral threat uh, incapable of delivering the destruction that its predecessors have. And in order to develop, it, and this is a core focus for CEPI in terms of partnering with uh, innovative organizations. So we have to develop the R&D capabilities and this we do at CEPI by partnering with innovative organizations, with countries, with governments, with um, multilateral organizations. Uh, we support R&D, we support the development of innovative platforms, and this will then feed into those manufacturing supply chains that I continually refer to. Um, however, the challenge that we've realized coming out of COVID was that in order to have this end-to-end -end supply chain, of R&D to manufacturing to delivery, we need to also ensure that this capability has some relevance and has some support during peacetime. 
So you can't suddenly develop manufacturing capabilities. You can't deliver, de develop delivery capabilities that will ramp up to meet demand effectively during a crisis if you don't have some sort of baseline capability already in place before a crisis hits. And this was one of the hard lessons of COVID. And lastly, to make all of this happen, from R&D to vaccines in arms, we need a trained and skilled workforce uh, to support this geodiversification strategy that I've referred to. So where do we fit into this picture of preparedness? Where does, what is the role that CEPI has to play and what is the expectation of CEPI? And I'd like to hear more about what your expectations are of us uh, in the discussion session. But for now, we were we would we came into being in 2017 at the World Economic Forum. Governments of the world realized that they needed an organization uh, even prior to COVID to better prepare the world for the next outbreak. And this was the vision uh, under which CEPI was created. In line with that vision, CEPI's mission is to accelerate the development of vaccines and biological countermeasures to respond to epidemic and pandemic threats. And inherent in our name is that we take a coalition approach to this. We take a partnership approach to this. And who are the key partners that we work with from an international organization perspective? We work with governments, regulators, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, emerging innovative organizations, uh, civil society organizations, and other multilateral organizations. So CEPI is very much about a connected approach to preparing for the next outbreak. We currently have the largest vaccine portfolio in the world. And how have we developed this vaccine portfolio? It came about through 70 partnerships, 250 grant awardees and sub-awardees across 50 countries. And as you could see, from this uh, illustration, the spread of activities is not as equitable as we would desire. So we are continually working at building our representation and capacity across the world so that this picture looks better before that next uh, outbreak emerges. So at the heart of all we do is equitable access. And the picture that we see right now is far from the equitable access picture that we would like to see before that ne next outbreak comes about. And I'll, I'll emphasize this point as um, I progress through the presentation. So I mentioned our vaccine portfolio. What does this vaccine portfolio comprise of? CEPI was formed even before COVID, set up to respond to the, 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 the greatest Pand epidemic and pandemic threats in the world, uh, the scariest viruses, to put it in simplest terms. So this is the portfolio that we've developed to respond to those viruses. We have, in, in respect of MERS, Lassa, and Nipah, early stage vaccine candidates, um, early stage in the sense of uh, early stage in, the, in, in clinical trials, phase one and phase two. For chikungunya, we have advanced stage clinical trials. And as some of you may know, for COVID-19, we have three candidates uh, that have emergency use authorization and are being deployed across the world as we speak and have been so for quite some time. But we continue to work to develop this vaccine portfolio to prepare for other diseases as well. And we have a range of activities uh, in, in re research and development activities in respect of Rift Valley fever, uh, a broadly protective coronavirus response. And most importantly, and what's often ignored, is we're also preparing for what we refer to as disease X. Disease X is that unknown pathogen um, that may be similar or completely different from all the pathogens that we currently are aware of. But it's that surprise factor. Uh, that we need the world to be ready for. And at the heart of what CEPI is about is preparation for disease X as well. So what did CEPI do uh, in order to prepare for COVID-19? How did we help the COVID-19 response? We were, an, we were an infant at the time. We had just been formed and 
due to CEPI being blessed with an extraordinary leader, we were able to mobilize and realize a substantial role and response to COVID-19. Uh, I've mentioned our vaccine portfolio, which has been in de development over the last uh, uh, five, six years. Um, we, uh, uh, we immediately realized at the COVID-19 outbreak that we need to accelerate and expand manufacturing, as I've repeatedly made the case for. We also realized that for disease X and other pathogens that threaten the, that could potentially threaten the world, we need to develop vaccines platforms and vaccines libraries that will capacitate us to respond to the known threats, but more importantly, to the unknown threats as well. Uh, we need to continue to strengthen our defenses through ongoing investment and, and growth of R&D capacity, uh, exploring every feasible option in vaccines, therapeutics, uh, and other countermeasures. And lastly, we need to look at our supply chain, uh, which has been a strong point of emphasis in my presentation uh, up to now. And most importantly, we need to look at the supply chain from, on an end-to-end -end basis. So. In, in the COVID response, we often realize certain strengths in our supply chain, but it's the weaknesses that undermined us. And I'll speak to that uh, further down the line. So I've spoken of access and why access is important to bring us closer to the outbreak to ensure that all parts of the world, not just some parts, are capacitated to respond to a crisis. So CEPI, uh, is driven by the fundamental principle that in order to respond to a crisis and in, re, in order to respond uh, to um, contain a healthcare crisis, we need to have diversity across the world, diversity of R&D, diversity of manufacturing, um, and diversity of uh, supply chain delivery mechanisms. And it's become cliched now that unless all of us are safe, none of us are safe. And this has been our driving principle from the day that we were set up. And this is reflected in our approach to equitable access. So to build on the themes that I've just mentioned, and I'm still referring to CEPI, but CEPI is fundamental to COVAX, uh, as you will see in a, in, a, in a minute or two. So how do we ensure that, that access is at the heart of all that we do. Firstly, in our R&D partnerships, we build in equitable access requirements. So we make equitable access a legal requirement insofar as we can, and we enforce these clauses in our R&D uh, contracts. We, we also realized the hard way that we need to be sensitive to vaccine demand. And this, while this is fundamental, to big pharma, it has not always been fundamental for those of us driven uh, through us so uh, driven by a social imperative. Um, but we have realized through COVID that we need to understand demand a lot better than we have in the course of COVID, and that all our strategies need to then align with this demand assessment. And while CEPI's capability in terms of vaccine demand assessment is not strong, it's um, we're more R and D focused. Uh, we do have partners that have better insight into this and feed into our strategies uh, in terms of development and geodiversification. I've spoken about manufacturing ex extensively, uh, but the one aspect of it that I have not referred to uh, yet is that in relation to, ac to access, as we all know, driving down the costs of production is sometimes as important as developing the new medical countermeasure or vaccine that we uh, have in mind for uh, a response. From an access point of view, if we don't pay keen attention to driving down the cost of production uh, almost as much as we do to ramping up production, large parts of the world will continue to be deprived of the medical countermeasure that we've developed. And again, uh, everyone will fail to be safe. Uh, lastly, in terms of uh, the innovations that we bring about in relation to vaccine development, uh, where we've taken a strong stand in terms of making 
the information that realizes out of our R&D efforts public. And there, those clauses that are referred to at the top of this slide are the clauses that make this happen. Uh, we have strong uh, uh, indications or strong requirements in terms of data sharing, public, public uh, availability of information. And we've even taken lessons from the IT industry, which has been grappling with open source, the open source debate for a long time. Um, and while this has been something that has not progressed effectively in healthcare, COVID has triggered a more rapid exploration of these uh, key issues in terms of their importance to innovation development, innovation and development. Um, lastly, we, we have to pay keen attention um, to the product profiles that we develop and their relevance to low and middle income countries. So not only do we focus our attention, our attention to developing the countermeasures that will respond to the next outbreak, but we also pay very keen attention to the product profiles of those responses and the suitability for uh, Elmix or for the global south. We look at uh, issues such as fractional dosing. We look at issues related to um, thermal stability, and we even look at the packaging and delivery mechanisms uh, for those products to ensure that they can be deployed effectively across the world and particularly uh, in most sensitive environments in the global south. Now, getting to the role that we play uh, in COVAX. As many of you would know, uh, the ACT Accelerator was set up as a mechanism to ensure equitable access during COVAX or to assure rather than ensure, I suppose. Um, and the ACT Accelerator, access, access to COVID Tools Accelerator um, has three pillars, the diagnostics pillar, the vaccines pillar, and the therapeutics pillar. Um, and it has two cross, uh, cross ma matrix type work streams, access and allocation, and health systems and response connector. So we're going to focus today on the vaccines pillar where CEPI and Gavi co-lead. So COVAX is about access to vaccines. It is a collaborative approach to creating vaccines access. Its intention is to support countries to meet their vaccination goals, ensure equitable access and fair distribution um, in relation to, to, to COVID bringing to an end the acute phase of the pandemic. Um, it also takes a very keen view on risk management and risk mitigation and takes a strong position on uh, diver diversification of response. So COVAX has had substantial success. Um, it has enabled access to 3 billion doses of vaccines, although only 1 billion have been delivered to date. Um, but through its cross-sharing mechanisms, uh, the, the, the um, access continues to grow. This is the spread of COVAX uh, interventions across the world. These are the countries that participate in COVAX. Um, the shading indicates the uh, interventions in terms of financial involvement. The red are the countries that are self-financing, and the blue countries are those who would need support in terms of uh, financing capacity to, to ensure that their populations are protected. So um, in addition to leading the COVAX pillar, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, um, CEPI also runs the COVAX marketplace. And this is a fundamental mechanism to addressing the supply chain challenges that I mentioned earlier. The, the, as with any other marketplace, this is about matching buyers and sellers in inverted commas. So how does CEPI go about this? Oh, what does the marketplace trigger in terms of this match? The marketplace provides an opportunity for suppliers with additional materials, uh, excess materials, if you will, um, that become available because their local markets have shifted in terms of demand and they didn't anticipate that. So they now sit with excess stock. The marketplace enables suppliers to move that excess stock to those in need. It also enables those who have idle stock because their vaccines or therapeutics were not um, 
were, were not uh, approved from a regulatory perspective, and it gives them an opportunity to redeploy those resources again to, um, to, to those in demand or need. And lastly, it allows manufacturers who have non-vaccine activities to move uh, surplus materials to those who have vaccine materials that are that are relevant to addressing an outbreak um, or epidemic. So that's how the marketplace works in broad strokes. So what are some of the lessons that we've learned from COVAX itself? I've addressed lessons from COVID through the course of the presentation, but there are some very specific lessons from COVAX. And there've been many reviews around the ACT Accelerator, around COVAX, um, and one could dwell on those um, over multiple days from the point of view of reflection. So I've crystallized those into five bullets, and I'd like us to consider those for a, a couple of minutes. Firstly, there's been varying perspectives on the objectives of COVAX, uh, whether those were pitched at the right level and the degree to which COVAX had achieved those. Secondly, um, the role that, Co sorry, Secondly, in terms of the development of COVAX, uh, it was questioned whether the Global South and whether uh, civil society organizations have ha had enough of a voice. And it obviously the premise here is that if they had more of a voice, a more balanced development of COVAX would have uh, occurred. However, one needs to remember that COVAX was developed under very pressured circumstances and under operationalized very fast. So the period for consultation uh, may not have been as, des um, as was desired. And uh, we now have the opportunity to remedy that. And it's not just the, the COVAX itself that has set up specific mechanisms to engage more broadly, but even the partners like Gavi and CEPI who feed into COVAX also have similarly set up mechanisms to engage uh, civil society organizations and the global South more effectively. And then with an organization of the size and complexity of COVAX and with the uh, enormous goals that it had to achieve, uh, government governance and decision making was fairly complex and often presented challenges and this had implications for speed of response and agility. Um, and then although all the COVAX targets were not met as intended, COVAX delivery, its interventions, uh, the way in which it reshaped the world and helped respond to, um, to COVID-19 is beyond question. Uh, I would dare say that we would struggle to imagine where we would be today if it were not for COVAX. And lastly, it's important through interventions such as the one that we're all present at today and through other opportunities that wherever we sit in society, wherever we sit in the world, whether it's in government, whether it's in a civil society organization, a multilateral organization, or even if you're just sitting at your desk as a as a citizen, we need to reflect on the COVID-19 experiences and how we can bring about a change and what we need to do to influence that change through whatever mechanisms we have at our disposal. So what is COVAX currently looking at? COVAX is still seeking to support countries achieve full vaccinations, full vaccination coverage uh, in terms of COVID-19. It continues to particularly in the global south strive to cover and vaccinate all high-risk populations. It also seeks to grow the scope of vaccination coverage beyond just adults but to adolescents as well. And while some countries are even looking at vaccinating those who are less than five years of age, COVAX is currently focused at most at the five to 12 year age range. And even that is only at the request of a member country. Uh, COVAX continues to support 34 of, uh, of the poorest countries in the world, those with the least capacity to respond to an outbreak in terms of finance and delivery. So it's a full spectrum of support that COVAX offers. Um, and for all member countries, uh, COVAX seeks to ensure that 
COVID-19 vaccinations are built into their primary health care programs. Um, lastly, and particularly driven by CEPI, COVAX continues to support R&D, uh, regulatory reform, uh, the, the policy ecosystem reform, so that the world is able to respond with greater agility and speed, and manufacturing development and geodiversity of manufacturing. Um, and lastly, and probably most importantly, we have to all, um, as countries of the world, continue to support COVAX so that it's enabled to procure and deploy new vaccines in the face of a potential uh, further outbreak. So what can we do um, in order to in order to uh, realize better outcomes in terms of our response going forward. Um, for particularly for, particular, uh, for political leaders and leaders of major organizations in countries and regions, we need to prepare for a range of possibilities uh, and not just a narrow set of not, not just have a narrow set of contingency plans in terms of a potential outbreak or epidemic or pandemic. And we need to look at how we integrate supply chains uh, either at a country level or across a region, uh, taking a hub approach to ensure that there's a, uh, uh, an effective uh, response to potential outbreaks. We also need to review the strategies that we've historically used in relation to testing, diagnostics, um, non-pharmaceutical in interventions and therapeutics. Uh, we realize sometimes too late that the use of these intervention measures could have been done better and they could have had a stronger contribution to our response. We need to work together to, to ensure that the policy and infrastructure environment is conducive to enabling innovation. And CEPI drives this at a global level, uh, trying to ensure that all the players at a global level and at a regional level align to create an ecosystem that is more responsive and better prepared, uh, but this also be, needs to be taken care of at country and regional uh, country level as well, and sometimes even organizational level. And fundamental to what we do and fundamental to the response of the world is collaboration. And amongst that whole list of areas where we could collaborate, I would say surveillance is the starting point and arguably the most important area uh, to focus on for, from a collaboration perspective. If we don't get that right, the rest of our response um, is at risk because it will be too late. And lastly, uh, I've spoken extensively about geodiversification and equitable access, uh, but I'd be amiss if I don't appeal uh, for all who have influence to continue to support the work of CEPI. So thank you very much for listening to me this uh, today. Um, I end with the final reminder that COVID-19 has not disappeared. The virus is evolving and adapting and continues to impact different parts of the world to different degrees. We need to continue to look at our pandemic preparedness and response, not just in a, on a myopic basis, but on an end-to-end -end basis. And lastly, this is a tall ask in the tough economic times that we all face currently, but we need to continue to invest in preparedness today if we are to be, if we are to respond more effectively in the future. Thank you for your attention.